Good evening, everyone. I am Chris McCord. I am honored to be with you this evening. I'm Assistant Superintendent of Operations for Conroe ISD and uh, honored to get to uh, help guide us through the uh, Grand Oaks Feeder Elementary and Attended Zone process. So we are here tonight live coming to you via Zoom. But also, I want you to know that we will be recording this presentation and will be, it will be available in the coming days at our Attendance Boundary Process website. I am also have a very, very special guest star with us tonight, and that is our Deputy Superintendent uh, of Conroe ISD, Dr. Chris Hines. He is with us, and so he is here. He is a special person as he has helped uh, shepherd Conroe ISD through boundary processes for the past two decades. And he also happens to be the namesake of the elementary school in the Grand Oaks Feeder, of which is the one of the main reasons we are gathered here tonight. So thank you for Dr. Hines, Dr. Hines for joining us and uh, we appreciate you. And with that, we are going to get started. At this time, you should be able to see my screen. And uh, as we get going, we're going to start and give you a little bit of background. We are here really for two main reasons. One, to talk about uh, the populating of the attendance zone for Dr. Christopher J. Hines Elementary School. Also to analyze and look at what we can do to help with the boundary processes of Cox and Clark, knowing that we have a large number of homes coming in to the Grand Oaks feeder, especially on the east side in the coming months and years. Uh, to give a little bit of background, we have a few slides to go through that will not take too long, but uh, just to know that the growth that you're seeing in Grand Oaks, it's a great place to live. It's a good place, a great place to go to school and you're seeing a lot of growth. It's really not just unique to Grand Oaks though. And we're seeing it as a school district. And uh, the last I looked just a couple of days ago, we were at 70,777 students in our district. Uh, you can see the numbers going back to 2018, 19, 20, 21 and 22. Uh, what has really changed in the last few years is not just our overall numbers, but the rate of growth. And we've really seen the rate of growth just about double. And from around 1,500 kids per year to over 3,000 per year, we had a uh, demographic study just a few years ago in 2018. I will refer to that periodically throughout this presentation. We have some very, very early preliminary results from a demographic study that we just conducted in the past couple of months. I may refer to that also, it's still preliminary. And so having said that, I uh, just want to give you a little bit of background and know that you certainly are not along, alone in seeing the growth that you have in Grand Oaks. Of our 65 campuses, 37 are over capacity. So that translates to 101% of capacity for our district. And currently to make it work, we are using 217 portable classrooms. Uh, that is not our preference, but uh, we will use it where needed. And, We've made it work really well. We have them fenced in. We've made them as nice as possible. Uh, and there are quite a few actually in the Grand Oaks feeder. You're probably familiar with them. So just talking about capacity, I mentioned that the district is over capacity at 101% of capacity. So what goes into determining what is capacity? And there are a number of things, but obviously the building size and total square footage is gonna be a part of it. How many classrooms are available for uh, instruction to occur? The student population size, how many kids go there, the grade levels, because there are different ratios for different grade levels. There may be special services, whether it's in special education, bilingual, ESL, pre-K, that will also impact the uh, capacity of a particular campus. And then the staffing, having place for staff to go. And that will vary a little bit from place to place, although it's fairly uniform. And all those weigh in to uh, what we do as far as reaching capacity or establishing capacity for a campus. And I think this is a unique, a good look at the elementary status for the district at this, this time. We're over 101%. Uh, if you look in the lower right-hand corner in the Southeast, you will see Grand Oaks. If you look at that, you will see the elementaries of the entire Grand Oaks area are all over capacity at this moment, which is one of the major reasons that we have uh, constructed and are populating and attended uh, creating an attendance boundary for Dr. Christopher J. Hines Elementary. But it's certainly not unique. You see it all throughout the district and the areas in red represent an elementary school zone that is currently over capacity. Intermediate schools, you'll see the same thing. I think your highest interest level will be in the lower right for Grand Oaks. You'll see Clark represented in red as it is well over capacity and a reason that we are here tonight 
And then you can see Cox represented in, in the purple lilac color that is under capacity, although not tremendously under capacity, Cox at this moment is under capacity. And then you can see Vogel in pink and Wilkerson just to the west or left. So just going through uh, junior high, uh, when we talk about junior high and we talk about the Grand Oaks, we're talking about York Good School. It is currently over capacity and uh, we're looking long-term at some things we could possibly do for York as far as helping it and Grand Oaks. Grand Oaks High School is now over capacity. You may be aware there are six portables that we have their boots on the ground. Uh, what you may not be aware of is that we all also uh, established seven new classrooms in the building. So we added 13 total classrooms in the fall of 2023 at Grand Oaks to accommodate growth. They would expect that same sort of pace to continue at the high school as we go into next year into the fall of 2023. But you can see uh, right here, you can see on the right or east side, you can see Caney Creek represented in pink. Caney Creek is probably a few weeks or a couple of months away from going over capacity. And then you can see Oak Ridge there in kind of the green color. Uh, so that is where we are now. And we may ask, well, what are we doing? What are we building? What are we adding? We added Annette Gordon Reed Elementary, and that is in the west side, the northwest side of our school district in the Conroe feeder. Ironically, it has a dedication tomorrow night, which we're very excited about. We also added a wing with 10 classrooms to the Conroe High School ninth grade campus in the Conroe High School feeder. Uh, next year, we're opening up Veterans Memorial Intermediate in Caney Creek. And uh, we're opening that up because we're building an expanded Moorhead Junior High in Grangerland. So, what will happen is the current Moorhead Junior High will become Veterans Memorial Intermediate. And then the Moorhead Junior High next fall will have a bigger building to accommodate what is growth that is really basically equivalent to what we're seeing in Grand Oaks that's occurring in the Candy Creek feeder. And then we're excited about the fall of 24 to open up Bartlett Elementary. We're on plan to get that done at this time to help relieve overcrowding for some elementaries at Austin, Creighton, Anderson, and Patterson. So that's kind of a look. This is a look not at school zones, but of the uh, district as a whole. And you can see the areas, and I will go into the Grand Oaks area in more detail, but the fast growth areas are shaded, and it's certainly not unique to Grand Oaks, but you'll see them up north. You'll see them along the 242 corridor, uh, just north of Grand Oaks. You'll see them on the southeast side of Conroe, on the north side, northwest side of 105, and the Conroe feeder on the west side of Conroe, Grand Central Park, and really all throughout our district and county. So, uh, Dr. Hines, you want to chime in anything about overall growth at this time? Uh, maybe pertinent to the audience. I think you you touched on the main points, which you know we're very we're we're pretty full right now, um, and we're going to have to continue to to look at ways to deal with that growth, and then um, you know, and hopefully we'll know more in the future about campuses that will be coming on in, in, the, in the near future, but uh, certainly we're crowded at this point. So just to hone in and talk a little bit more about Grand Oaks, elementary, elementary level within Grand Oaks, just some data and facts that will be pertinent to our conversation over the next few minutes. So once again, we had a, a demographers, PASA did an analysis back in 2018. They're a good group. They usually give us really good data. And they were able to find that uh, we would be 4,397 elementary students in the year 2028. Uh, so after we open up Christopher J. Hines Elementary in the fall of 23, that will give us a capacity of 4,750 elementary, elementary seats for 23-24. Well, with everything that went on with the economy and interest rates and just being a great place to live in Grand Oaks and great people, uh, we've seen that we've already passed that projection. So we are at 121% of capacity for elementary schools in the Grand Oaks feeder. And uh, we know we have Dr. Christopher J. Hines Elementary coming on in August of 23. We know we're going to need an additional elementary school in the near future beyond Hines Elementary. I want to make a special note about Ford. Ford is very much a part of the Grand Oaks feeder. And it's made up mainly of Fox Run and Spring Creek Pines. But I will tell you that uh, what will happen will be is that uh, because they are not impacted by the rezoning because of the distance away and the number of campuses that we have to get that are close to Christopher Hines Elementary. And that what will happen 
is that uh, we did not involve them in this process because we were not going to be able to to accommodate changes on their campus. And we, did, we did not want to cause consternation among their staff, their students, or their parents. So just a special note there about Ford Elementary. So let's talk about the intermediate level because that's also something we're looking at. So on the same study, we had a 28 projection for intermediate students in Grand Oaks for 1,850. So between Clark and Cox, we have a population, we can house a population of 1,900 kids. So we ended last year with roughly 1,900 kids or that number at the end of the school year. Uh, just a, a couple of days ago, or yesterday, we ended the day with 1,963 students combined between Clark and Cox. So we've already eclipsed what we thought we would have in 28, according to the demographers. And we do know that we will need an additional intermediate school at some time in a relatively near future to house the students in the fast growing area of Grand Oaks. Here is a good picture that I think, and I'm going to move my cursor over where I think you can see. This shows the shaded areas specifically to Grand Oaks showing the uh, fast growth. And you can see an area down here in Harmony, you see Woodson's Reserve. The area right here, if you look at the screen, N57, this is an area of special attention. It also is the area where Heinz Elementary is located and is being constructed at this time. You can see the areas here on the east side that are undeveloped. And these areas are, uh, that is where um, majority of the future growth will come from Grand Oaks. I would note right in here, there is a sand pit and a sand pit will take up some of this room here. There's a sand pit right about here where you see my cursor in the lower area. So that is also a factor. As far as the timetable of the build out of that area on the east side, a lot of it will be determined by when Townsend is constructed going from north to south down to the uh, Kingwood Drive slash uh, Deerbrook Mall type area. So that is a factor there. Dr. Hines, you are an expert on the Grand Oaks build out and area there on the east side. Dr. Hines, uh, if you're there, do you have any thoughts, anything to add above and beyond what I said there? No, there's just a lot, there's a lot of building that's still, you know, we know that the there's still building going on in Woodson's Reserve. There's some smaller uh, parcels that are out there that can be developed. And then certainly there's the, the larger RICO development that you mentioned to the south that um, at some point there's not access to yet and, and but will develop eventually. It's just a matter of when they get access to it. So that's a quick look at the current and future high growth areas. Let's get down to the star of the show, the new elementary school. So this is going to be opening in August of 23. We know it will accommodate 950 students. The plan is for it to be kindergarten through fourth grade. You probably have seen it. It's located at 4550 Lexington Boulevard. Here is a computer rendering of the front of the school. We uh, have two buildings that are very similar to this one already. That's Hope Elementary in the Caney Creek Zone and Annette Gordon Reed Elementary in the Conroe Zone. And for each of these buildings, the front facade, the front entrance will be different. And you can see here, this is a nice and attractive building. And uh, I've been inside these buildings, the two that we have. And I think you're really going to like them. The kids are really going to like them. And it's going to be a great place to be. Here is an aerial view via drone. And this was taken in the middle of September. This is from the east, northeast, looking back toward the west. If you can see Dr. Christopher J. Hines Elementary School here, if I look to the left, that would be going south, and that would take me to Clark. If I turn right, I go to the Grand Parkway and Grand Oaks High School. Just there, there's a picture of Christopher J. Hines Elementary. Here's the inside, and uh, this is very similar to what we have at Gordon Reed and Hope. You have the cafeteria, the stage, the library, all adjacent to each other, very useful very handy if you're running a school or you have kids that need to get to and fro. Uh, <clears throat> just here, if you can see my cursor, <clears throat> excuse me, this will take you to the front door and the front office area right through here. So that's a look at it. Uh, the colors are still being determined to some degree. Here's a look at the hallway corridor. Uh, you can see what it looks like there in the hallways. And uh, I will tell you, we currently have been working on this for a while. We have a long way to go on the boundary committee. And we have a superstar cast of, of parents and principals and district staffers to help us along the way. But appreciate the effort. A lot of time and effort has been put in by these uh, fine people already. 
But here's a list by school of the principal and the parent representative. And then here are some district representatives, including myself and Dr. Hines, that are here to help us along the way as we start the boundary process. And so we have a long ways to go, a lot of vetting and a lot of analyzing. And so the process has started. We've done a lot of work, but we have a long way to go. So we're going to take our time and make sure we get it just right. This is worth stopping and elaborating on. If you look here, this is a, a table chart that will show you where we are right now. And you can look at it and see the capacity on the left, the enrollment in the middle, and the, and the portable classrooms on the right. And when you look at it, Grand Oaks High School, a uh, little bit over capacity, York uh, over capacity. We can see Clark, and this is a real concern and one of the two aspects of this boundary committee. And usually on a boundary committee, you're looking at one school. But we have two functions of this committee, and that is to look at the populating of the attendance boundary for Heinz Elementary, but also to analyze what we need to do for Clark and Cox. And you can see the percentages of capacity that Clark is way considerably over capacity. Cox is, uh, is under capacity at this time. If those two numbers were reversed, we wouldn't be in great shape, but we would be in pretty good shape. But, uh, but they're not reversed. And so that's why we need to look at it knowing that the uh, – a uh, large amount of growth that is about to ensue in the Grand Oaks feeder is going to be in that N57 area, which is where Woodson's Reserve is and where Heinz Elementary is and feeds, uh, at least for the moment, into Clark Intermediate. So you can see the numbers there. Going down to the elementary schools, we can see Burnham Woods. We can see it's right at capacity or a little over. Burnham Woods is projected to see a little bit of growth, but it is largely built out, but not entirely. Bradley still has some growth to do. Uh, so Bradley is not completely built out. It does not have a tremendous amount of growth, but it is still projected to experience a little bit of more growth. Broadway, obviously considerably over 137% of capacity. Taking care of Broadway is one of the main primary functions of this committee. Uh, Ford, I talked about Ford previously. Ford, you can see its numbers right now. And Ford is projected to, it is not completely built out or grown out, but just mild to moderate growth to steady uh, for the next few years. It is largely close to its capacity. Snyder Elementary, 135% of capacity. That's another primary school that we have to render some assistance to. And so that is a look. Dr. Hines, you're an expert on this area here in the Grand Oaks feeder. You have numbers in front of you. Anything to elaborate on? No, I think you you touched on it. If you know, we talk about our priorities, we have to address um, for sure the crowding at Snyder and Broadway, and then I think you know we we will look at you know we're certainly crowded at Bradley, um, and then it raises the question of whether we address that through zoning or whether we do it through programs or other things that we could perhaps touch to try to reduce uh, the Bradley enrollment. So all of those are discussions for the ABC to, to keep having, but, you know, you can see where we have to, to move. I, I will point out Burnham Woods is probably at or near peak enrollment that, you know, the falls area is going to start to mature a little bit in the coming years. So um, we think that will stabilize and parts of the Broadway area in the spring trails have started to stabilize in terms of their, um, you know, maturing of the of the students kind of moving through the system. So um, we don't we don't see that ongoing building going on. There's one section of harmony that's in that area that's still growing. Um, and depending on what happens to that section, we'll keep an eye on. But but you know that's that's that other question is we have some parts of the of the community that are that are still building and adding and then we have other parts that have been there for a while and the students have kind of moved through in a bubble. Uh, one of the questions we get is you know when is when is peak enrollment? And for this community in the Grand Oaks area, it's been around seventh grade is when we hit peak enrollment. So moving along, just, you know, what are we trying to accomplish and why are we here and what is our function? So obviously, uh, basically every school in America had to originally have an attendance zone created for it. And Dr. Christopher J. Hines Elementary is no different. And so we are here to develop an attendance boundary for Christopher J. Hines Elementary. 
And uh, but the goal would be to do that while preserving some campus capacity for future growth at that site. So ideally, we would open up that campus, which has a capacity of 950 students. Ideally, we would open it up at under 700. We could probably make it work if it's under 750. Anything over 750 is going to probably be problematic because there are a lot of kids that are going to come to that area. So ideally, we're trying to open up probably under 700. We'll see what we can do while making sure that we help accommodate Snyder and Broadway and potentially and possibly Bradley. To analyze for changes to Cox and Clark in anticipation of the rapid growth that Clark is about to see in intermediate grades of fifth and sixth, and knowing that Clark is already well over capacity, even as we are, we're here tonight. And then if we possibly, we talked about addressing uh, crowding relief and capacity to grant other Grand Oaks elementaries, depending upon what we, what we can do. We only have one building at this time, so we can't solve for every issue, but we're gonna do our best to make a good thought out decision. And then we'll ultimately make a recommendation to the school board and then they will decide on what we do. So there you go. So right now let's talk about what does it look like right now at the elementary level? So if you look here, you can see Snyder represented in yellow. You see Snyder in yellow, you can see Broadway in the uh, purple color in the lower left in the Southwest. You can see Burnham Woods in brown. You can see Bradley in pink and over there, you can see uh, Fox Run, you can see Ford in green on the far left or western side. That's what we look like right now. Major points of lines uh, serving as lines of demarcation. The biggest one, of course, is I move my cursor being uh, the Grand Parkway uh, right there going from northeast to southwest. This is, uh, and this will be recorded, you can look at it later, but this shows you, I think this is useful, and I included this slide, the red numbers show you the number of elementary kids that live in each of these zones. So these zones are zones that we create uh, for zone, for just helping do zoning. And so they're all numbered. They have a number and a letter. And you can see that a lot of these areas are very, very densely populated. So there are limits to how many changes you can make as far as neighborhoods. But you can see some have uh, the falls, you can see spring trails, areas of Bender's Landing estates and Bender's Landing, uh, a lot of kids and a lot of good kids. And so this would be on the website uh, once you wanna go back and look at this video and you can see those numbers and I think it's very helpful. So I'm gonna talk specifically about section N57. So I'm gonna go back right now and I'm gonna point with my pointer right here is N57, I talked about it earlier. That is a new area of Woodson's Reserve the uh, developer tells us to expect approximately around or approaching 2,000 homes in that section. They're coming in the coming months to years. Uh, it translates roughly to about a 1,120 additional students from that very small section alone. Uh, if nothing changes, 170 of those kids would go approximately to Clark, and that would put Clark even higher up to around 121% of capacity and that does not consider other growth within the Clark area. So a special note there regarding N57, it's always important to note, note that we, the numbers we talk about are geocoded. They are kids that live and sleep in that zone. You have kids that are on transfer due to a number of different reasons. Maybe their parents work in that school or adjacent to that school. So sometimes the numbers of the actual kids in the school and what we have uh, geocoded are not exactly the same, but they're close. But I did want to make a note regarding geocoded just to make sure that it was clear. Here you can see uh, Ford. And remember, Ford splits. And Ford is not a part of this because I said we did not want to cause consternation between with their uh, parents and students regarding possible changes. Here's a good look. Remember, Ford splits between Grand Oaks and Oak Ridge High School. So there is a good look at Ford. And I think this is helpful too. Spring Creek Pines and Fox Run, I will pull my cursor here. This is where, this is uh, Ford, right in this area right here. But you can see we went through a lot of work to work with MCAD and other entities to label all the different areas, whether it be Bender's Landing Estates, Woodson's Reserve, Bender's Landing, Harmony, Spring Trails, Creekside Village, Wright's Landing, Legends Run, The Falls, et cetera, et cetera. And I want you to know that the committee has already been working on this, but keeping neighborhoods together 
is something that we effort to do and we want to do and we strive to do and we know it's important to you. And many of us live in neighborhoods also, and we understand how important it is. The numbers will may dictate it may in some cases be impossible, but I do want you to know that keeping neighborhoods together is a high priority for the entire committee and something that historically has been important to the school board and something that we will effort to do if at all possible. So there's a look, this will be in this presentation if you ever wanna go back and look at it and get more information. Okay, so can we point out something, Mr. McCord? Yes, sir. Go that. If you'll go back. Yeah, if you'll go back. There it is. So a couple of things I'll point out. One, when you look at our planning maps, you'll notice that we do subdivide neighborhoods and we have to do that because of just simply the size and the number of students that are involved. So we do, we do break up sometimes neighborhoods into two or three or four planning units. Um, and I would point out that there are a couple of neighborhoods that are currently split. Uh, the Falls being one, um, Legends Run, and uh, Harmony. And so I think it's just important. You know, we've tried to avoid it, but sometimes you just can't help it. And um, so it does happen, but we do look at it and we keep that in the forefront as the committee works through. So thank you. So I'm going to run through some of the scenarios that are still in committee consideration. And once again, we have just gotten started and we are adding uh, scenarios constantly and vetting them and tweaking them. And I'm not going to spend any length of time on each scenario because it's on the attendance boundary process webpage for Christopher J. Hines Elementary and Intermediate Process for Cox and Clark. So I'm just going to flip through these quickly, but I want to show you ones that are still under consideration as well as some that are no longer under consideration. But even the ones that are no longer under consideration, there may be aspects or tenets of them that may be useful. But uh, just here's scenario two, and there's nothing special about scenario two other than it's the first one that's still under consideration. If you look here, these tables are really helpful. When I post this video, uh, Heinz Elementary, it would be very helpful to be under 700. We really do need to be under 750. Snyder, you can see here we're way over. Uh, Bradley, we're somewhat over. And Broadway, we are way over percent of our cap capacity. So we're working to solve those. And so those are things that we're looking at doing. Here's scenario two. And once again, all these scenarios are at the website, the boundary process website, and you can look at them at your leisure. But two and five, uh, 6.1, you can go back and look at. 6.2, which is just an iteration of six, obviously. Seven and seven was submitted via the website, as was nine and 9.1 which was submitted via the website at the elementary level. Those are still under consideration. There are some that are no longer under consideration, but once again, I said possibilities of aspects of them could always be incorporated, including scenario one. You can go back and look at it at your leisure, 1.2, uh, number three, four, six, eight, which was submitted via the website, uh, nine, which was submitted via the website, and those are all there. Dr. Hines, as I flip through those and they can go back and look at their leisure, anything to say about the... Uh, well, uh, a couple of things I would say is that there's there are still scenarios that come, come in daily. I'm sure there'll still be tweaks of scenarios. We're still pretty early in the process, right? So we're at that kind of that brainstorming. We're starting in that brainstorming phase where we're trying to get out ideas. And then some of these, the committee hadn't even really looked at and talked about yet. I think we meet this week. So There'll, there'll be another round, I'm sure, of, of coming up with new ideas and eliminating some that have already been put out there is no longer being viable. And um, But it is a, an ongoing process where, you know, we're still at that brainstorming. So I, I think it's a good reminder if you are thinking about a submitting your own scenario for as the committee to look at sooner rather than later, because we do have to build maps out and uh, we want to get those in as soon as we can. So I salute Regina Woody and Jessica Villarreal, part of our team. They helped create this school mileage map. So this may be helpful when you look at different scenarios to look at the mileage. Uh, that is included for you. You can look when you review this presentation if you choose to do so. So I'm going to switch gears and talk about the uh, intermediate zones. Right now, this is a picture of the intermediate zone for the Grand Oaks feeder. Everything you see in pink is Clark. Everything you see in yellow is Cox. So you can see that right now the Clark geographical footprint is obviously much longer, much larger than Cox. 
And part of that is because it includes all these undeveloped areas on the east and northeast and the far south side. Uh, just for just for pointing out where it is. So Clark is right here, number 60, and 65 is Chris Hines Elementary School. And so over here, you're going to have Cox in the yellow. And that may be helpful as we follow through. So I will quickly flip through these and you can go back and look at your leisure. Uh, these are ones still under consideration, either because they're under consideration or we haven't had a chance to vet them yet because they've just been submitted. But here is scenario one. And once again, everything in pink would go to Clark. Everything in yellow would go to Cox. Here's scenario three, still under consideration uh, <clears throat> at this moment. Scenario four, a recent addition. We'll vet that tomorrow. And then scenario five, still under consideration. <clears throat> and then scenario 5.1, which is just a variable of scenario 5.0. So there are some that we've considered over the last few weeks that are no longer under consideration. But once again, there are aspects of them that could be adopted. And that includes scenario 2.0, which you can see at the website at your leisure. Uh, and then right here, this is helpful. This is the intermediate school's mileage to help uh, establish mileage based on the different scenarios that are out there right now, one, two, three, four, and five at the intermediate level, as well as 5.1. I think this is really helpful and it can give you mileage and it'll save you a lot of time and it's useful for going over. So really, once again, remember that the issue at uh, the intermediate level is that we are way, well over capacity at Clark. We're under capacity, although certainly not empty by any stretch of the imagination at Cox. But the issue is the oncoming growth that is about to descend upon the area is going to be highly concentrated at Clark. And that is why we are looking at the Clark and Cox boundaries as part of this process. Dr. Hines, any thoughts or musings or elaborations on Cox and Clark? No, and, and, and while you were showing that, I, I would point out, we had a question come in about if people wanted to submit scenarios and and I think at the end you're going to show them where the spreadsheets are on the website and and there and there are current maps on the website as well so um where they can start from but it's it's there's actually a spreadsheet where you do it by by the sections as well so if you're going to submit a spreadsheet what would help us is if you could you submit a complete spreadsheet Remember some of the things that we talked about that we're looking at as far as population sizes and while we're while we are doing this. Uh, also, it's important to go back and look at scenarios that have already been done. It's really easy to recreate a scenario that's already been created. So uh, that's just something to throw out. And but I think the mileage chart will help you. That's there for your use. So I do want you to know the boundary process is challenging because we realize this and we treat it with respect. And uh, we know that schools are communities, that families often have a history of attending a particular school. And it's very important to you. It's something we take very seriously. And that oftentimes you choose where to, where to live based on where a particular school is at the time that you move into that area. So this is something the committee and us take seriously. And I will tell you also from years of experience, it's something the board understands and they understand and they take it seriously. And so this is something that we currently talk, constantly talk about in the process of the attendance boundary process. So just some goals and really no particular uh, order is to be uh, mindful that we're providing for the education of everybody. We, we take that seriously. We try to draw our boundaries efficient for effective use of the school facilities and maintaining fiscal responsibility. We try to plan for future growth. An example, that's what we're looking at doing with Cox and Clark. And we're trying to reduce the enrollment in overcrowded campuses. The best example of that are Schneider and Broadway. And we are very transparent. Everything we have is on the attendance boundary process webpage. I will show that to you in the end. And so we will look at these. So here's the way it works. So we're going to our attendance boundary committee will look at really two things. A, popula uh, a zone for Dr. Christopher J. Hines Elementary School and a recommendation for potential rezoning to Cox and Clark. So we will vet this over the few, next few months. We're just getting started. You haven't missed a thing, and that's why we're having this to kick it off right now. And so eventually we will go through the process. We'll spiral back and give the board an update in November of how, where we are and how things are looking. And then uh, in January, we'll make a recommendation to go to the school board 
And the school board will be able to accept our recommendation or send us back to tweak it or adopt uh, potentially a different one based on what they decide that we need to do is the best interest of the district. But that's kind of the timetable. And so really your comments that you put on the boundary process webpage really help us. And it's seen by everyone on the school board and it's seen by everyone in our boundary committee. And lots of times it's easy to add comments when we don't like something, well, no matter what the case may be. But if you see something you do like or aspects of a, of a recommendation you do like, it really helps to tell us that and through the boundary process webpage, which I'll show you at the end. Dr. Hines, anything to add there on zoning goals, maybe to elaborate on? No, I think you've covered it pretty well and that uh, we, we do uh, look at the feedback and we would encourage people. And I think you, you kind of laid it out there. This is kind of a, a, a multi-step process. When we get to, uh, hopefully we'll have a board recommendation in January and you know we'll be able to, to, to move on with staffing after that and, and making some decisions. But it is important that we kind of stay on track. And now we're, is really when we're starting this, this process of looking at scenarios. And the next time we we come back, hopefully we'll have two or three or four, or whatever that we're really, that we're real interested in that we can live with and try to narrow it down from there. So I don't like to read PowerPoint slides, but I think these are important to note. So in really no particular order, uh, things that we're going to look at are the capacity of the campuses that we're dealing with. Uh, we'll take community input, input through the uh, boundary process webpage, demographic factors, uh, feeder patterns. So we will try to come up with a recommendation at the elementary level and at the intermediate level that those two recommendations jive with each other. So we will analyze, overlay, and when we get to the end of the road, we will try to make sure we make recommendations that make sense and they're congruent between the elementary and the intermediate level. Geographical proximity. So people will constantly ask, you know, how likely am I to be rezoned if I am going to be rezoned? And really what I would say is just obviously the closer you live to a school, then the more likely you would be to go to that school due to a lot of reasons, many of which are listed here in blue. But we consider existing neighborhoods and communities. We'd like to keep them together if all possible. Some things like roads or railroads uh, may or waterways may bound and make good dividing lines. We try to minimize the impact on families. We want to move the smallest number of kids we can to accomplish the goal of what needs to happen to make it work for everybody. But our goal is to move uh, the minimum number of kids we possibly can. And so we looked at the number of times an area may have been rezoned or if they've ever been rezoned. Uh, we know possible locations of future schools, future enrollments like through our demographic study, and then transportation issues. And we know that there's a lot of traffic around our county, including Grand Oaks. So when we zone, we want to make the best decisions we can to take into account traffic and movement and uh, just how things flow within the area. Dr. Hines, anything to add to that? No, I think you got it. And, you know, we know this is a rapidly growing area. We are trying to, you know, be aware of that. We anticipate in the future there'll be more schools that come in. And, you know, so you have to think about, okay, if we open another school three years from now, where, how might that impact these communities? But um, unfortunately, we've just seen such rapid growth. We know we have to do something um, to address the crowding at, at Broadway and Snyder. I think you mentioned it earlier. I think when, when you start to look at the scenarios and you see where the, where the crowding is, um, you know, I'll point out that the impact, the impact number of students that end up having to move in order for us to accomplish the objectives of reducing crowding at Broadway and Snyder and then add a and create a boundary for, for Hines. The reality is Snyder is, is going to be impacted a lot as well because Broadway will likely move students, you know, kind of moving towards Snyder and Snyder will move, lose students towards Hines. And so, um, there's going to be some changes. One of the questions that came in uh, was, you know, where are the teachers going to come from? And, and the reality is the teachers would come from particularly the schools that lose enrollment. So in this case, we're talking about uh, Broadway and Snyder would each lose enrollment. And with that, they would lose teaching positions that would that would transfer to Hines. 
So moving along, just I mentioned, we take this as a very serious endeavor that we go through as far as moving potentially boundaries, moving boundaries. We're committed to making a quality educational experience everywhere at all our schools, everywhere. And so, like I said, we would like to have a recommendation to the board in January for their decision. Uh, there are some typical questions and we just decided to answer them proactively. So what grades are going to be impacted by the zoning of Heinz Elementary? Our plans now is that it would be kindergarten through fourth grade. So it would be kindergarten through fourth grade in opening of fall of 23. And the school is moving along. And so we're feeling good about that day for happening in fall of 23, August of 23. So I talked about how likely is it that my neighborhood will be rezoned. We'll go through the process. We'll vet it, give it all the attention it deserves and the seriousness it deserves. And then we'll make a good decision and the board will ultimately make that decision. They're the ones in January that will make that decision. So we'll go through the process. The closer you live to a campus, the more likely you are to go to that campus just due to geographical proximity. But there are other factors that would be considered. Some special programs, we will decide those administratively at the end. And those could be things like uh, bilingual, special ed, pre-kindergarten, pre-K. So we'll look at those and those decisions will be made at the end of the process. Uh, this is one we get a lot and one I think you need to know. And if you're asked about, I think it's helpful to be able to relay that information. Is traditionally, if you have a child who's attended a campus and th that you're, you get rezoned as a family, we will allow that child to finish the year at the campus he or she is currently zoned for. Okay, they would, in other words, you could request a transfer and they would stay at that campus for one year, provided you uh, provided transportation. But if you also, you have a child who is in their last year at a campus that's getting rezoned and he or you have other, well, your child has other siblings, you have other children at that campus and you're willing to provide transportation. Traditionally, we will effort to allow uh, the child in his, his or her last year and the other child to stay at that school provided you provide transportation. So we try to not to rezone any more often than we have to. The uh, faster growing areas, it's more challenging for school districts all across the country, just like ours. And Grand Oaks is one of the fastest growing in the nation and one of the best to be in. So, you know, we try to make it as few times as possible to rezone or to change a family or a student because we realize how important it is. You know, our goal would be four years, but we would also like to go longer, but we will do our best. And uh, so we try to minimize it and do it no more often than it has to have. Dr. Howden's any thoughts to add to that? Yeah, we're and I think that's part of the the dilemma as we work on the intermediate boundaries as well. Now the, the good news about intermediates is we don't, you know, students are only there for two years, so we don't have to make it as long if we have to come back and rezone. But uh, but we anticipate in the future in this area we're gonna have to provide uh as we know, we're already crowded at, at Clark and Cox is close to capacity. Um, so we're going to have to have some intermediate relief in the future. So we know we're going to have to come back. And that's something that the committee is wrestling back and forth with, right? Is do we do we just hold on and keep adding portables at Clark and try to ride it out till we get a new solution? But we don't know when the solution is going to be. So those are the things that we're um, certainly having to wrestle through and, and, and work through. But the good news about intermediate is students go through in two years, so we shouldn't impact the same cohort. Uh, so if we do a change, we wouldn't change it for two years, and it would take at least that long before we'd have an intermediate solution. Uh, I think elementary, as we know, this is just a growing area. It's also difficult for us to find locations in this area because we're dependent on the developers uh, to cut in streets and, and put in spots uh, before we can actually say where a school can be. Um, and we are in the process of acquiring uh, additional locations, and they may not be as far away from existing schools as we would like, but we'll have to make it work. Uh, and so we will uh, anticipate more schools coming in this area in the future. So here's where we are tonight. It is October 4th, and on my pointer, so this is where we are. So we have a presentation just to kind of introduce the process this evening. So tomorrow night, we'll be at York at six o'clock. This is the very same presentation we would do tomorrow night. It's no, nothing's different at all. And once again, if you have feedback, the effective way to submit it is via the website. That's where the school board sees it and the boundary committee sees it. 
So that is the effective way to submit uh, your thoughts, musings, and suggestions. So, and then we'll come back again in November and we'll have some scenarios to show you. I'll spend a lot more time with them going over details. Once again, the scenarios that are, that are just being introduced are on our website now under, under the Boundary Process webpage. And you can certainly look at those at your leisure. And you can go back and look at this presentation to see some of the factors that are used in determining which boundary process will ultimately get recommended to the school board. So that's kind of where we're looking and uh, where we're going there. Here is the attendance boundary webpage. If you go to the Conroe ISD webpage, you can go there and it is in the very middle and you can, you can click on attendance boundary process. You'll have two options, the Grand Oaks Feeder Elementary and Intermediate Attendance Zone process. If you're watching this this evening or on after it's recorded, in all likelihood, that's where you're going to want to go. There's also one going on for Veterans Memorial in Caney Creek, another intermediate we're excited about. But you can give feedback. You can see uh, scenarios that are still under consideration. You can see scenarios that are no longer under consideration. You can create your own scenario. You can ask, frequently ask questions. And uh, there's a lot of data there. It's all out there for you. It's very helpful. And I think it's one of the better websites around, and I think it's very useful. So, Dr. Hines, before we close this out, anything else you can think of, sir? Uh, any wisdom for us? No, it's just that we've got um, – we'll be back to show, like I said, some more uh, – a much smaller number of scenarios. And, again, if anybody has something they want the committee to look at, I would really encourage in the next week to 10 days to be sure that those are in to give uh, enough time to get those vetted and set up. Thank you. So, hey, we appreciate you. Give us a little bit of time. We'll get this posted, this video on the Attendance Boundary webpage. We'll also get it converted to Spanish. Know your time is valuable. Thank you for giving us about 47 minutes this evening. We appreciate you and have a great evening. Thank you very much.